Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming out tonight. Um, we have a very exciting speaker here, and I'm delighted that I could be part of this event. Um, and I wanted to take a minute and tell you why I'm here to interview Dr. Camella. Um, and I'm a journalist, and I like writing all about human behavior and society and have always been interested in human sexual behavior but have found it very difficult to write about. Um, there's not always very good data available. Uh, it's a topic that a lot of people are uncomfortable with including newspaper and magazine editors. And um, when I started work on my book, which is called The Women Who Made New York, I began looking at all these different parts of New York and trying to figure out sort of which were the women that I wanted to feature. And to do that, I had to look at different parts of New York City. And a part of New York City that I thought couldn't be left out was sort of how sexy it is. And this, you know, the sexual aspect of New York. I mean, this is where you had, Times Square and peep shows. This is where you had the meatpacking district and transvestites, uh, always found a home here, LGBT culture, all those things. And so when I selected um, the women to feature in my book, I found women who had been involved in sort of the sexy part of New York in different ways. And one of the women I mention is someone named Del Williams. And Del Williams opened a a shop on West 57th Street in an office building. And it was a sex toy shop for women. And the idea of a sex toy shop for women might sound really small, but it actually was a very radical thing. Um, and it was a really big deal that this door opened, although it wasn't on the ground level. Uh, there were no displays. It was in an office building, and you had to take an elevator to get there. And I remember this because when I came to New York City and went to college here, I went there. And, you know, I visited this place. So um, when I found out last year that you were working on this book, I was absolutely fascinated because the book explores the history of Del Williams and several other women like her in the country who really wanted to uh, revolutionize or help uh, women revolutionize how they thought about themselves and their body and their sexual life. And so um, I have so many questions for you. Just and dive in? Dive in. I okay. mean, the, you know, first of all, I wonder how you became interested in this subject. Sure. Well, let me just say first, like, I'm really excited to be in New York. I'm really excited to be at the Strand in this amazing rare book room. And I also just want to kind of give shout outs to people who are in the audience who I know from various places, who I know from Las Vegas, who I know from graduate school at the University of Massachusetts and colleagues. And so it's just really nice to see, um, you know, so many people here tonight. So very appreciative. Thank you. Um, so how did I get started? Um, on researching and writing about um, feminist sex toy shops in the United States. Um, it actually started in graduate school, uh, which um, I did my PhD at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, and I was taking a seminar course on fieldwork methods and cultural studies, and we had to do a small little pilot project. And um, it was actually the late 1990s. So for those of you who are old enough to read remember New York in the kind of mid-90s and late 90s. I had actually done my master's degree in New York City at the New School for Social Research. And I left to start my PhD at UMass Amherst. But that period of time was really interesting in New York because Mayor Giuliani was ramping up his quality of life campaign. Um, throughout the 90s, they were trying to redo the zoning ordinances. Um, particularly around Times Square to make room for Disney. So I became really interested in public culture, debates around public culture, but also those spaces that people can kind of occupy their sexuality publicly. And um, what really kind of, you know, sparked my interest in this project was thinking about where in particular are those spaces where women can go, where they can walk into their sexual subjectivity and be positioned as sexual agents as opposed to sexual objects. And I knew that feminist sex shops existed. I had by that point been to Good Vibrations. So um, 
it just so happened a small little feminist sex shop existed in Northampton, Massachusetts at the time. And so I decided to do my little paper on that store and became so deeply fascinated by what I found. Um, and a couple of things just, you know, really um, sparked my interest was in that initial interview that I did with the store's founder, she told me that she saw her business as a feminist way to empower women and that she had based her business on the good vibrations retail model. And I thought, wow, that's really fascinating. There's this whole model of doing this, of talking about sex, of selling sex toys, of displaying products, of leading with education. Um, and I just became fascinated in this whole network of businesses across the country that also had adopted this similar way of selling sex toys and kind of doing retail-based sex education. So that little project became my dissertation, and then years later, um, after many, many more years of research, this book. I, I wonder what it is about academics in Massachusetts because, you know, our bodies ourselves know, kind right. of came out of some professors in the late 60s who were just trying to put on a seminar about women and their bodies and sexual health. Right. And they began having meetings and having conversations. And uh, out of these conversations, they realized everybody in the room had had what they called a bad doctor experience where they had seen a doctor and the doctor had sort of treated them or talked about their bodies or talked about their opinions in a really sort of condescending way. And that led them to create the article and then sort of these kitchen table conversations out of which eventually the book grew. So, um, you know, what was taking place uh, that led these women to have the idea that they could do sex education in a store? Yeah. Well, I'm really glad that you brought up Our Bodies Ourselves because the first kind of women-friendly vibrator shops really came from a similar kind of impulse, right? Um, Our Bodies Ourselves was a really DIY project, and it was really addressing this need that a group of women saw in the culture. We want more accessible forms of information about our bodies that aren't coming to us from the top down, from the medical establishment or for male doctors, but that we're actually creating, right? We're putting our own stamp on kind of information about our bodies, encouraging women to learn about their bodies. And a similar kind of ethos really spurred the first, um, you know, women who ventured into the world of selling vibrators to other women. Um, so you mentioned Del Williams, and it's fitting because we're in New York to talk a little bit about that business. The business still exists. It's still in an office building in Midtown. Um, you would have to know where to look for it because it doesn't have a street level storefront. You take the elevator up so upstairs. It's almost as though you're going to a dentist's office, right? It is as kind of unsafe sexy and antiseptic as possible as you try to find it. There's a little placard on the door. But back in the day, Del Williams, um, you know, she, she discovered the women's liberation movement in her early 50s and it changed her life. And she was friends with Betty Dodson, who by that point had started to talk about and write about the importance of female masturbation and women taking control of her their own orgasms. And uh, Del Williams and Betty were friends. Del took one of Betty Dodson's very famous body sex workshops, um, which I think Betty Dodson still is hosting, um, and she's in her late 80s now. But after that workshop, Del Williams felt newly empowered, and she, you know, said, I'm going to go get my first vibrator. So she, t you know, took off down the street marching into Macy's because there were very few places where you could go. Um, and you could get vibrators um, or electric massagers at department stores. So she takes off to Macy's, finds her way to the electronics department, and then she's kind of confronted with a male sales clerk who's kind of very imposing and prize and says, well, what are you really going to use this for? And she was mortified and embarrassed. So all of this newfound confidence that she thought she had just disappeared, and she was frustrated that she had to be embarrassed in the process of getting 
you know, what by then was being framed as a tool of liberation. So, so she um, left the store, did get her vibrator, and thought women should be selling these things to other women. And that was what sparked, um, you know, her to eventually found Eve's Garden, which, importantly, did not start in a shop originally, but was originally a mail order catalog. So she was packaging up vibrators to ship in her Manhattan apartment in her kitchen. She would come home from work after a long day of working and fulfill mail orders and package them up, sometimes with the help of her younger brother. And um, it was a very small operation. Did they sign, like, you know, packaged by? So, you know, you get stuff now and they... They yeah, little no, cards I don't. I don't think there was was <laughs> anything like that. So when we talk about like the history of these businesses, they were they were scrappy, small businesses, very DIY, and weren't coming from a place of this is going to be a great money maker, but coming from a place of this is really important. These to are help. tools of liberation. We so, want to get these into more people's hands. So go back and maybe can you t tell everybody, uh, and I don't know if you've seen her fabulous Instagram account, but can you tell everybody what it was like or how people purchased sexual toys and vibrators prior to this time? And I'm talking about, you know, sex toys have been around for centuries right. but in this country it's not it's certainly something that wasn't openly talked wasn't about openly talked and about. so you know how were these things sold and advertised yeah, i mean you know <laughs> The vibrator in particular has gone through kind of different incarnations. I mean, if you want to talk about the history of a technology, that's an interesting technology to, to think about in terms of its start as a medical device and then it's, you know, um, uh, being marketed as a health and beauty aid and then eventually more explicitly as a sexual device. But certainly in the earlier part of the 20th century, you would find, you know, um, these kind of big, bulky, vibrating controls contraptions in you know women's magazines and they were sold as as health as health devices so um, in my research I came across a um, the Shelton uh, user's guide the Shelton vibrators user's guide I have a picture of it in the book but it's fascinating to look at because you know it talks about all of the potential uh, health ailments that um, vibrating technology can cure. And it includes everything from dandruff to insomnia to wrinkles. And the list goes on and on and on. So basically, if you had a problem, you know, the vibrator was your cure-all. So by, by the 60s, you know, certainly by the time that, you know, these devices started to show up, you know, in, in dirty movies, it was clear that they had a sexual use, although arguably people always knew it had a sexual use. But, um, you know, they were, they were uh, marketed uh, in a much more kind of oblique, obscured way. They were socially camouflaged. Um, and it is interesting to, to look at some of those, those ads, right? Because it's all about, you know, the, the kind of massager that will change your life, you know, and you have to surmise what that might um, be like. Uh, but um, it really was um, those early second wave feminists who um, did some really important early work on not just bringing kind of vibrators out into the open and framing them as tools of liberation, but that was part of much larger conversations that had started to happen publicly around women's sexual pleasure, around women taking control of their orgasms, around the importance of women learning about their bodies, right? It, so all of those things were happening, and the vibrator was one part of that. And what women were saying was, this is great, this is awesome. I love the fact, Elle Williams, that you're, you know, talking about, you know, vibrators or Betty Dodson or in San Francisco, Joni Blank, you know, who's founded Good Vibrations, was a sex therapist, encouraging women to, you know, perhaps consider purchasing a vibrator. And what these women started to hear was women saying, I love this idea. Sign me up. A tool of liberation, pleasure, bring it on. And they realized that there weren't 
places where they could easily go that were accessible, friendly, that they wouldn't feel harassed or harangued or treated dismissively. Right, because most most and most retailers that had sexual products or sexual element were what? Were your typical traditional adult shop or or you know just kind of adult store where the emphasis wasn't even really on adult novelties or sex toys or quote unquote marital marital aids but more on pornography right so the the sex toys what few of them were on the market were really an afterthought but women had a few choices they could you know try to find a reputable mail order company there were a few or they could muster up the courage to go into these more traditional adult shops and you know Oftentimes, it wasn't a pleasant experience. Oftentimes, they would be treated with hostility or um, harassed, like, oh, you know, you must really need it bad, sweetie pie, to go into a shop like that. Or the experience that Dal Williams had. You march into Macy's, right, and, and, you know, hope for the best. So there was a need, and the early entrepreneurs kind of rolled up their sleeves and just kind of jumped into this breach in the marketplace um, because there wasn't anybody who was specifically addressing, you know, vibrator shops for women. So talk about, you know, in the book you talk about a sex-positive diaspora of feminist retailers. I mean, what do you mean by that? Can you talk about this idea of sex-positive, you know, what does that mean? Sure. So... Yeah, I talk about um, in the book this sex positive diaspora of, of feminist sex toy retailers that has really emerged in the last 40 years. And, you know, all the businesses that I write about, and you probably heard of some of them. I mean, you know, we're in New York, so there's Eve's Garden, but there's also Babeland, you know, with several locations in the city and in Brooklyn. Um, there is Early to Bed in Chicago, Self Serve in Albuquerque, Smitten Kitten in Minneapolis, Sugar in Baltimore, um, Feel More in Oakland. So there's this whole network of businesses that have kind of followed in the footsteps of these early feminist entrepreneurs um, and uh, really have thought differently about what kind of place sex toy shops could be and who they could be for, you know, who, what, what kinds of customers they could be for. Um, so this idea of sex positivity is really central to the businesses that I write about. And sex positivity, um, you know, to distill it to its core, it basically starts from the premise that everybody deserves access to accurate sexual information, that nobody should be shamed for wanting more pleasure or information in their lives, that, you know, there's a kind of diversity of sexual desires um, and fantasies, and that, you know, essentially anything goes as long as it's consensual, important, and, you know, legal of age. Um, and so it's this idea that these businesses wanted to create retail spaces where curious individuals looking for something, maybe a product, but maybe just an answer to a question that they never felt comfortable getting from anywhere else. They could walk into a store and know that they're not going to be made to feel embarrassed or ashamed for having a question, no matter how basic or sophisticated it might be. And um, that uh, the stores really value the education piece. And that, I really should say, had everything to do with Good Vibrations founder Joni Blank. Whereas Del Williams was a women's liberationist who kind of, you know, discovered the politics of sex through the women's li liberation movement. Joni Blank, who was an ardent feminist, was also um, a sex professional. She had a master's degree in public health, and she had worked for a number of years as a sex therapist. So she took everything that she learned about the world of sex therapy and sex education and brought it into a retail space. And she treated the sex shop floor as an occasion to educate people. So that became a really important cornerstone of Good Vibrations. So years later, when the founders of Babeland, Claire Cavanaugh and Rachel Venning, decided that they wanted to open up a shop in Seattle, which is where the original Babeland is, they called Joni Blank 
literally called her. We want to open a store like yours. And they had a brief consultation with Joni, and she basically said, you want to open a store like mine? Come on down. Come to San Francisco. You can do an internship with us. We will teach you everything about what we do. Now, if you know anything about business, businesses don't do that. They don't do that. They don't say, here's our vendor lists. Here's our books. You can see our profit and loss reports. Actually, come to our warehouse, and we will show you how we do our mail order. And Joni Blank was very non-competitive, and her whole MO was the more businesses that are doing what Good Vibrations is doing in the world, the better the world will be. And she lived that. She walked the walk. She didn't just talk the talk. So in the 90s, when a few businesses said, we want to do what you do, she, she literally kind of brought them into the fold for a few weeks, had, uh, you know, staff help train them, and she met with them one-on-one, -on -one and essentially gave them the equivalent of a kind of sex shop starter kit, which they took back to their cities. And um, How that's... How did she stay in business, though? I mean, if most businesses, you know, are not you know, they're not so generous. I mean, obviously her mission was greater than making money. She probably could have found more lucrative lines of work. So, but how do you balance those things? I mean, in the interviews that you did. Um, it's probably one of the, well, it, it, that question is, is really one of the dominant themes that runs through the book, is that tension and that challenge of running a mission-driven business and at the same time figuring out how to run a business, right? And the early entrepreneurs really downplayed um, the business side of running a business because they were all about social change and they were all about creating conversations around sex and they were all about, um, you know, these being a mission-driven enterprise where it was about, you know, changing the way people talked and, and thought about sexuality. So in the early years of these businesses, um, they really led with social change. And um, what that meant was the business part of running a business often went unattended. And um, it was a, a theme that ran throughout almost every interview, this deep discomfort that these feminist entrepreneurs had with their position within the system of consumer capitalism. They knew that they were running a business, but they much preferred to think of themselves and describe themselves as sex educators and activists. And um, it posed some real challenges for, for businesses. And, you know, when I was doing my field work at Babeland in the early 2000s. I worked as um, a staff sex educator at the Rivington Street store, which was fantastic. Um, and again, also something that business people don't do is let a researcher <laughs> like do research and work, you know? But it was incredible ethnographic access, so generous. So I got an inside view of the business, which also meant I got to see what was working and what wasn't working. So I was there, you know, three weeks into field work where some really, really difficult conversations were happening around profitability, um, you know, and they had to do some cost cutting measures. And there was actually an employee that got laid off and it was really traumatic for the staff. But what was interesting for me was it was the first time um, in nine years, the first time since the company was founded that there were open conversations within the company about money. The first time. And at that point in time, the CEO that they had, they had promoted someone from the sales floor to a manager and then gave her the position as like the COO or CEO. Do you want to guess what her undergrad degree was in? Film studies, of course, it makes total sense. That's all you need to run a multi-million dollar business. So, so you get the picture, right? Like it, it took these businesses many, many years and a lot of painful hiccups along the way to, to figure out the business piece of it because they just kind of wanted, it wasn't as fun. You know, it wasn't as fun to look at spreadsheets as it was to, you know, help someone have, you know, maybe their first orgasm ever, right? That's more fun. So, so you know, I want to I get to 
the business of pleasure because obviously now it is a much bigger business and vibrators are available at drugstores at, you know, go to Dwayne Reed and go to walmart.com and they have them. Um, but, uh, going back to sort of the founding of these businesses, I mean, you've talked about how sex educators were thinking of this as an education project or women who were part of the women's liberation movement. You know, what about other people who were part of starting these businesses? What about, you know, lesbians, queer identifying people? What, what role did they play yeah. in, in starting these businesses? Huge, a huge role. I mean, I would say that the history of feminist sex toy businesses in the U.S. is also a history of queer entrepreneurship. If you look at the businesses, you know, that, that are part of the story that I tell, actually the majority of them were founded by lesbians and queer identifying um, individuals. And you know, that, that, that is really important and needs to be acknowledged. Um, and, you know, I asked people uh, that I interviewed, I mean, in the course of my research, I did 80 plus interviews with, you know, retailers, um, sex shop employees and marketers and feminist pornographers and sex toy manufacturers. And, you know, a lot of the queer identified folks that I was interviewing really, you know, noted the fact that there was a lot of were a lot of queer women, you know, leading this movement. And, you know, it was not lost on them that, you know, queer women were having really important sex positive sex education conversations with a lot of straight men. So there was this sense that, you know, queer women were at, on the vanguard of kind of queering heterosexuality. And I write about that a little bit in the book. So um, it, it did bring a different orientation to the businesses. Is, Wait, right? I'm, I'm going to stop you. Queering heterosexuality. Yeah. Can you, you know, expand on that, please? Sure. Um, so what I mean by that is this idea of um, thinking outside of boxes, right? Thinking outside of binary categories. Um, one way to kind of queer heterosexuality is to, you know, basically challenge the idea that straight sex needs to look like. X needs to look like, you know, something in particular. So, you know, a big trend in the late 90s, early 2000s, um, what I found in my research was, and this is an example of queering heterosexuality, is the whole bend over boyfriend phenomena. The whole phenomena of women. Go there, huh? Yeah, <laughs> where we're going. But, but, and, and so that's a good idea, the good example though of queering heterosexuality where, you know, uh, a female partner can be in the driver's seat. It is okay for, uh, you know, straight identifying man to be receptive, right? And these conversations were happening on the sex shop floor and um, you know conversations that uh, some people came in wanting some you know customers came in looking specifically for the information or maybe customers would overhear conversations that might be happening um, and and inquire later but so I think that um, these sex shops um, gave people some freedom to think maybe differently about the way that they had been socialized around gender, sex, and power, or around gendered sexual relationships. Well, and that's the queering, right? It just means kind of breaking open boxes that don't really need to be there in the first place, you know? And historically weren't always there. I mean, in, in you know, ancient cultures uh, and ancient Hindu texts and ancient Chinese art. I mean, there's there's so many examples of uh, human sexuality, human interactions that accounted for women's sexual pleasure. Mm -hmm. And then in American society, it seems like those depictions were just completely absent, you know, for such a long time. So, you know, can you speak to sort of the larger changes in culture that happened in part because of these women and, and also, how did that then change um, the sex industry or sex retailers, you know, the wider adult industry? Yeah, that's a really... I know that's two, those are no, kind of two big it's, questions, it's a good, but... It's a good question. I mean, you know, part of where I end the book, um, and I talk about this in the conclusion, is that, um, you know, I make a case throughout the book 
Um, well, let me back up for a second. When I started working on this project, you know, in my mind, it was a history of feminist sex toy stores and the retail culture that had kind of grown up around these businesses. But the more I got into my research and seeing the larger market shifts that happened, particularly starting around 2008, it became clear to me that um, the fact that around 2008, there was all of this focused attention around you know, female consumers of adult novelties and sex toys had everything to do with the feminist pioneers that set the stage and helped to grow a market. And that was really interesting for me to see that shift as a researcher because around 2008, um, a couple things were happening in the larger adult industry. Um, you had the, the big economic recession. And the porn industry had, for decades, considered itself recession-proof. And it realized that it actually was not recession-proof, that it was you know, um, potentially a victim of the same kind of economic ebbs and flows that other industries were. And yet, at that same time, you had the rise of online you had piracy that the porn industry was trying to combat and uh, uh, free tube sites. So all of a sudden around 2008, the um, wider porn industry took a huge hit. It was just bleeding money. And there were a lot of conversations about, you know, could it survive? Well, businesses began to look at the numbers. And what the numbers, as porn was in a free fall, the one segment of the adult industry that was growing and actually doing very, very well was the sex toy industry. And in looking at those numbers, industry analysts realized that it was women who, was, who were driving this, this industry. And, and I make that little detour because um, it is very much the case, I argue in the book, that, um, you know, feminist sex toy shops really grew a market. You know, these businesses in the 70s sat someplace in a marketplace where there was not yet a market. And then by 2008, they had helped to grow a market that was sizable enough that the mainstream industry, which had long ignored women, all of a sudden wanted to cater to women, and they didn't know how. So who were they turning to? Good Vibrations, Babeland, all of these businesses that they just thought were these quirky, marginalized, hippy-dippy feminist businesses in the Bay Area. They were like, show us how you do this. How do you get women into your businesses? How do you market to women? And all of these uh, seminars started to happen at the Adult Entertainment Expo in Las Vegas, which were all about how to market to women, how to do sex ed in retail spaces. Who were the speakers? Folks from Good Vibrations, folks from Babeland, folks from Self Serve. And I argue that you know, that wouldn't have happened without the feminist pioneers because they grew that market to be sizable enough that it got, you know, big enough that the mainstream market wanted a piece of it. And can you give the audience a sense of scale? I mean, because when you look at the numbers involved in the adult industry, I mean, it's staggering, right? You know, you mentioned in the book, you know, um, buyers who had three million, a budget of $3 million to buy toys at the industry show, and they couldn't even get the time of day because yeah. they're so small compared to back in the yeah when when before women became hot right like these the, the, you know these these buyers right from these small feminist businesses would come to these large industry trade shows and and uh, the the people the the wholesalers and distributors weren't paying any mind to them right like they didn't see them as kind of being significant business um, Nailing down numbers is really, really tricky when it comes to <clears throat> the adult industry, and you should always take those figures with a grain of salt because they're largely made up. I mean, because these are not publicly traded companies. It's, so there's at that, you know, it's at the, one of my, I wanted to ask you two more questions and then I want to open it up yeah. to the audience. But, you know, what are some of the challenges of doing scholarly work in this field? I mean, that's what I ran into when I tried to do reporting on these subjects. First of all, if you take data that people People provide, you know, uh, y'all lie. We all lie, you know, when we're filling out forms. So yeah. self-reported sexual data isn't always very trustworthy. And then the, you know, pornography industry and all of these things that are privately held, they don't have to release yeah. numbers. So you're relying on experts who are estimating. Yeah. It's not yeah. that easy. Yeah. So, you know, um, a figure that 
kind of gets floated around, I think I have in the book, is like, um, uh, uh, you know, that the sex toy sector purportedly, right, I'm using these qualifiers, purportedly generates, you know, 13 billion a year. And then if you, you know, it's important to flip to that footnote, right? Because I kind of talk in that footnote about these, you know, these numbers are just difficult, if not impossible, to reliably substantiate. Um, so that's the number that's used, and I cite all the places that use it. But then I also, you know, in that footnote, cite the uh, editor of AVN's Pleasure Product magazine. And she's like, look, this is worldwide. It also includes things like, you know, sex furniture and lubricants, right, and, and sex dolls, right? All these things kind of go into this figure. But um, we, we don't actually know. So the money piece, um, you know, I liked it back in the day when Joni Blank and Good Vibrations were publishing their cost and their, their, um, uh, their uh, financial reports in their in-house newsletter, right? Because you have at least what they were reporting circa 1986 or 87 or 88. So you could get some data that way. Um, you know, I have copies of some profit and loss reports from back in the day, but um, it's, it's really, really challenging to reliably, you know, cobble that information together um, because people don't, don't reveal that. Um, or, you know, maybe there was a point in time in a company's history where they did, but they stopped, you know? So uh, challenges in doing research really quickly. Um, you know, in, in, in this yeah. topic, oh, because yeah, I mean, certainly sure. I've encountered, you know, from, yeah. from the most reputable sources. And then you have people who are, uh, you know, yeah, because and, there's so much, many problems in sex um, industry as well. You know, and, and there's probably some researchers here in the audience. So, I mean, this is, you know, a, a bigger conversation to be had. But, I mean, I think, you know, I mean, for my book, I used um, a number of different methods. I did in-depth interviews. And of those, I did multiple interviews over the course sometimes of 10 years where I returned to a person to kind of, you know, follow up or explore something that I didn't, you know, ask in interview two, three, four, and five or whatever. So, um, you know, I, I, I had people that, that I had cultivated research relationships with over many, many years. So I did in-depth interviews. I, you know, did have the good fortune of getting access to work on the sales floor at Babeland, where I spent, you know, six months. Um, I did archival research, both at institutions like Cornell University, which has a really fantastic human sexuality collection. And I also did archival research, um, digging through file cabinets and Joni Blank's basement. Um, I did file cabinets in community-based, uh, not file cabinets, I did research um, in community-based archives. And then I attended a lot of industry trade shows because it became clear to me that I really wanted to hear what people within the industry were saying to each other, right, about the shifts in the market. So it's a very kind of multi-pronged approach. And, you know, you're always kind of fact-checking and cross-referencing and, you know, people's memories can be fuzzy. So Joni Blank's recollection of this one incident might be one thing, but then you have seven other people who worked with her in the 1980s who say something completely different, but theirs line up, right? So there, you know, you, you look for, the, for those types of things. But, um, you know, I have to say, I've been at this for a while now, um, you know, kind of studying, you know, different sectors of the adult industry. And I'm really heartened by the fact that there's a kind of growing emerging community of sexuality scholars, particularly looking at sexual economies, um, that really uh, is quite different than 10 years ago or 15 years ago. I just came back from the Society for Cinema uh, as for the Society for Cinema and Media Studies Conference in Toronto. They have an adult film history interest group. There is now a journal published 
published by Routledge called Porn Studies. There's more kind of academic work going on, and we're seeing the kind of cultivation of a kind of field and a community of scholars that I find really, really exciting. Um, there are certainly challenges. You know, it's, it's, it's hard to get tenure track jobs when you're doing certain kind of research. And it's hard to get tenure when you're doing certain kinds of research. It matters to have the institutional support, which is always available everywhere. Um, so those things can be challenging too. But I'm really excited by, honestly, like the next generation of up and coming gender and sexuality scholars who I think are doing really, really um, exciting, incredible work. So one last question before I open it to okay. the audience. But um, was there anything that surprised you when you were doing your research, something that you came across that was unexpected or um, really change the direction you were looking in? Well, two things. Um, and, and then, yes, I'm kind of interested in questions. Um, Del Williams and a handful of other really rad feminist sex pioneers have donated their archives to Cornell. So um, Del donated hers around 2008, 2009. And I was really, really excited to discover that she had kept customer letters from the 70s and the 80s into the 90s. And not only did she have like, you know, these customer letters that were like on pink stationery or yellow notebook paper, but in many instances, she had replied to these people who wrote her. She was still a mail order business, so people were far flung writing to her. Some had never been to her New York store. She took the time in many cases to respond. And there are copies of her responses because it was back in the era where people kind of typed on carbon copies. So there's carbon copies. So that was super exciting. And then really quickly, you know, one of the, the surprising things for me was I was studying feminist entrepreneurs. I was studying businesswomen, and many of them hated to think of themselves as businesswomen, just hated it. And they would rail against that description, um, kind of Joni Blank shaking her fist, you know, not literally, but, you know, very close to doing that. And um, that was so interesting for me, this kind of deep-seated unease that a number of the women I was interviewing who had grown really successful businesses from nothing had when it came to thinking of themselves as business women. It was really fascinating to me. I think that's fascinating because, you know, there's a whole contingent of feminists now who say the final frontier of feminism is finance and, and the economic power. You know, I think the other final frontier in feminism is sexual liberation. And it's sort of like twin powers that well, go together, maybe. It, it is. I mean, uh, and I think there's a kind of newer generation of feminist retailers who are really adamant about the importance of money and making money, and they're being more explicit about that. And I kind of really appreciate that frankness and honesty, because I've talked to so many people who won't be explicit, you know, who, who weren't comfortable being explicit. But what I found in my research really quickly was that many of these retailers had successfully kind of recuperated and redefined sex. And kind of, you know, the, the thing that they saw as an impurity wasn't sex, it was money. And that was really deeply fascinating to me. I could ask you a million more questions, but I wanted to open to the audience. Does anybody have a question for Lynn? Yeah. And Hi I think there's there. a microphone that's going to come to you, so. Thank you. Hi, Lynn. Hi. Good to see you. Good to see you, too. Uh, this may be outside of the scope of what you did, but when you said the word diaspora, I was thinking, what was happening internationally during this time period? In other words, is Good Vibrations, instead of just inspiring American sex shops, is it inspiring England, or are they being inspired by things that are happening in Europe or in countries where maybe this process was happening before it began in America? That's a really, really great question. And you. I, uh, you know, I did focus, you know, you know, as researchers, you have to set some parameters around your research. Um, uh, and I, I made the decision to focus, you know, on, on the U.S., you know, so the book is very U.S. focused. That was intentional because there were enough of these businesses, and this was the network that I was really interested in, in at least, you know, while I was working on the book, studying. But um, Good Vibrations did inspire uh, uh, Come As You Are in Toronto, worked closely with Good Vibrations and Joni Blank when they were starting their business. And 
from 1992 until 2006, Good Vibrations was actually run as a worker-owned cooperative. And that was one of the pieces that Come As You Are was really interested in, how to not just do what Good Vibrations did, but also the cooperative business model, the worker-owner business model. Um, I recently came back from Australia, and I met a woman there who started a business called Bliss in the 1990s, and she was directly motivated um, to start her business by Joni Blank and Good Vibrations. Um, so that was a really interesting to meet her and to hear a little bit about that journey. And it's worth noting, um, when we talked, I did, she, uh, she writes a column now for, for um, a newspaper there, and she just said that this tension between business and the mission so deeply resonated with her because basically she had to move her shop completely online because she was so in debt that she couldn't get out of it because she could never figure out the business piece. So, you know, there's stores like this in London, in Sydney, um, and, uh, you know, there really has been a kind of trickle effect, although I'm limited, you know, how deeply I can speak to, to the, those histories, but uh, those are two instances where people directly referenced being inspired by Joni Blank and the Good Vibrations model. Any other questions? Hi. Hi, Olga. It's a microphone coming to you. So um, everything is very, very interesting, but I was particularly intrigued by these letters to the businesses. Can you talk about these letters? What are they writing about? And what does she write back oh, to Oh gosh, them? great question. I am so glad you asked me about that because these letters were just, they were a gold mine. I mean, they were a gold mine and they were one of these kind of boxes of archival materials that was kind of under lock and key until 2060, unless you got special permission. So thank goodness, you know, um, uh, folks at Cornell allowed me to, to see those. So um, they were, many of them from women, but not all of them, and uh, they, I, uh, they, they were about anything, but a lot of them were very frank, confessional um, disclosures about kind of, uh, you know, being very deeply unsatisfied with one's life, having a, you know, um, this one lesbian identified letter writer said how, you know, she, she felt like, you know, she just had this non-functioning body that was so distressful to her and she, you know, her partners could always have orgasms easily and she couldn't, what's wrong with her? Another young person wrote in and said that, you know, she had gone to the doctor and her doctor told her, a male doctor, that she could get, you know, addicted to her vibrator and Del Williams said, that's bunk, I am just hopping mad that that doctor would ever, so she would dispense this really folksy wisdom, you know, really kind of colloquial we all and approachable, but it could be about um, losing desire after a hysterectomy. Um, sometimes it was just letters of thanks. Thank you for existing. Um, you know, people would write from, you know, uh, the South saying, you know, we don't have a store like this in Louisville. I was, you know, so happy to, you know, see your ad in Cosmo, and then I wrote for your mail ad or mail order catalog and it had all this information and people would say I feel like you wrote the catalog it's okay no bother <laughs> <laughs> I feel like you wrote the catalog for me so a lot of people felt really seen you know felt that, really yeah. seen by this feminist vibrator shop even though they had never been to New York so a, a lot of those those types of things um, and and just letters of thanks for creating um, a welcoming feminist identified place and then some of the letters were funny they're like what's a feminist like you doing in a business like this and then in parentheses She's like, but send me your catalog. I mean, just like hysteric, you know, stuff that people do, right? Like I, hope, we're I hope you made a photocopy of that one. I, I, I couldn't because you couldn't copy the letters. I had to um, type them all. I typed them all out. And this was kind of back in the day before, like, I really had a smartphone that could take good photos. Now, if I was going to an archive, I could just take photos of those letters. But I was doing like hardcore 
old school, type in those things verbatim, even with the typos, you know. But, you know, um, when I was doing research for my book, one of the women I included in my chapter that I call the liberators was Barbara Giddings. You know Barbara Giddings? Barbara Giddings um, was the head of the New York chapter of the Daughters of Belitis, which was a lesbian group. And she eventually became the editor-in-chief of their magazine called The Ladder. And the magazine went to lesbians all throughout the country, and, you know, mid mid 20th century, um, before the internet, you have to realize that there were so many people who were in the closet all over the country. Um, they would write letters to Barbara Giddings saying, thank you, your magazine is keeping me alive, because they felt so alone. And, and your sexual identity, I think, is so you know connected to who your your whole identity that I think a, a store like this or you know the the publication she was providing really was a resource that you know for some people just made all the difference and just another like researcher comment those letters I mean they were um, really fascinating but kind of very deeply important as well because you know it's one thing to hear a store owner say we change lives and, and you're like, okay, maybe, but how do I verify that, right? How do I know? I mean, that's, that, that's your account of all the good work that you've done, right? So, right, we have to kind of keep that skepticism, you know, but I kept hearing that, right? Like, people come into our store, they, they feel transformed, they feel empowered, you know. And then these letters were this kind of cornucopia of testimonials where people are saying, you know, your mail order catalog changed my life. The vibrator you mailed me sent, you know, changed my life. Um, the store, I had such a good interaction. I'm transformed. So it was really, uh, it verified. Evidence. Um, a great, a gr it was evidence. It verified, evidence. right? And, and so it's like, oh, okay, maybe there is something to this, you know, personal transformation that everybody keeps talking about because these letters substantiate it in this significant way. Lynn, can you tell us about any letters you saw from men? I'd, I'd be curious about. Yeah, yeah. Um, so one letter in particular, um, and I think I just make passing reference to it in the book, but it was from a man who wrote, I mean, it was like, you know, maybe five pages long. And, you know, it was uh, the letter, um, he, he was looking for advice um, for what he could do to essentially uh, encourage his wife to kind of claim and take hold of her sexuality. You know, like he wanted to know what suggestions Dell might have because he saw her being kind of, you know, just uh, holding back, right? Like not really feeling entitled to kind of pleasure or orgasm. So it was this kind of concerned spouse, you know, very, it went on very long though, very, very long too. So it, it does raise the question, like there was, you know, that, that he was getting something I think out of the process of writing the letter too, whatever that may be. I mean, I'm not a psychoanalyst, but it was a good like five, five pages, very, very detailed, but it came, you know, uh, you know, from a place of, you know, at least what he described in the letter of um, knowing that Del Williams had had her own sexual journey and what advice could she impart to him that could help him kind of create a space where his wife could have a similar sexual journey. Next question. Hi, thank you. This is so interesting. Um, my question is, do you feel that this concept of the feminist sex st store is um, speaking to mainstream culture, for lack of a better phrase? Um, do you, I guess, in other words, do you find that the main consumers and supporters are identifying as feminist or are otherwise from kind of societal niches, like academic or otherwise? Um, and if it's not mainstream yet, in your opinion, do you feel like it's on the cusp of becoming or is that in the foreseeable future? 
such a good question. I mean, I know that when I was doing my field work at Babeland, people from all over the city and the boroughs, from all sorts of walks of life, ages, you know, sexual orientations, um, gender identities, came into came into that store, right? So my guess, if I just had to guess, was that the majority of customers weren't feminist identifying customers. So it definitely had appeal um, to to people from all walks of life. Um, it's worth noting that a theme came up. A theme that came up in some of my research was that um, there were conversations among business owners and staff members at different points in time across different businesses about whether or not to market themselves as feminist businesses. That uh, retailers identify deeply as feminists and their businesses were feminist, but they were concerned that if they incorporated the language, you know, feminist into ads, that um, it created the potential for that word to be interpreted in ways that were different than how they were using it, right? And so, you know, the, you know, women friendly sometimes gets interpreted as women only, which stands in as a coded way to say lesbian. And so there were these discussions of, um, we are a feminist business, but how, to what degree do we put that into our marketing? Because for many people, feminism is a dirty word. It's an exclusionary word. So these were internal conversations and struggles and all of those things. The main streaming question is trickier because what um, what we've seen over the past 10 years in particular with this quote-unquote discovery of women, right? They just fell from the sky one day as this fully formed market of consumers. Not, but, um, but we have seen this trend whereby um, retail businesses that historically weren't that concerned with, with women um, all of a sudden were. And so they did recalibrate and change their business practices, and they did adopt a lot of what the good vibrations and babelands of the world were doing, which just kind of created a more competitive marketplace. So, um, you know, it, it's very, very interesting that you can go into stores now that 10 or 15 years ago would have looked differently, would have had different people working there, wouldn't maybe have had products displayed openly that you could pick them up. So part of the mainstreaming of sex toys is the mainstreaming of the model that these businesses help create. So it, it's, it's, I'm not, it's a hard question to ask because I'm not quite sure how mainstream, in the mainstream of mainstream, self-serve in Albuquerque is. But what they're doing has become more mainstream. So I write about in the book's conclusion that these businesses have, in some ways, become victims of their own success. They've created a highly successful market that you know, has actually made it harder for them to survive. Um, and that's, that's kind of where I end the book on, that note. Interesting. Um, yeah, we have a question in front. Hi. Uh, first, congratulations for the work, your life work. Uh, first question I have too. Was it any organized force, any groups during the 70s and 80s against this form of liberation in our society? And the second question is, do you have any information how much of the women's toys are bought from men? Well, I'll, I'll answer the first question. So the, the question was, was there any organized opposition? Um, which is a really good question. Organized opposition in the way that we may have seen with kind of um, groups like Women Against Pornography who were very organized, um, you know, against, you know, uh, adult theaters in Times Square and, and other, other things and who were really um, working quite hard to stamp out pornography. Um, and no, there weren't, there weren't those, you know, uh, I didn't find any evidence um, of, you know, organized protests at, at the stores for selling vibrators. Um, you know, I think that, uh, I've seen neighborhood protests when people want to open a sex product 
store, whether it's videos or sex toys. I've certainly mm -hmm. seen in various places right. in America where there are local protests because they don't want that kind sure. of store, but not like a national No, so, so the way that I want to answer that question really briefly is what you see with feminist sex toy shops is historically they've really um, played up the ways in which they're different from traditional sex toy shops, right? Like they play up the fact that we're kind of wholesome, we're safe, we're well-lighted, whereas those other stores are kind of dirty, dingy, maybe sleazy, and they've been able to gain greater legitimacy um, in certain cities, and they've also, in some instances, been able to sidestep otherwise restrictive zoning ordinances. And that was the case. A good example of this is when Good Vibrations opened its second store in the Bay Area in Berkeley. They were one week away from opening their doors, and someone complained to like the county commission or council, whatever it was and um, good vibrations rallied its customers and fan base to kind of write letters in support of good vibrations as an important Bay Area institution and they basically you know um, I had some of those letters and some of the letters to council people say good vibrations is not one of those dirty sleazy stores it is educationally oriented so you don't see protests with signs, but you do, in, mo in some instances, see kind of nervous community members who do worry, what does it mean, and, and does the zoning ordinance as it's written allow for this type of business? And businesses have done creative things. They've gotten license for like bath and beauty products, for example. Um, Self-serve in Albuquerque, there's a very restrictive zoning ordinance in Albuquerque, and so to kind of work within that and get around that, they can only carry a certain percentage of adult products. and so to make sure that they're in adherence, they've measured like every square inch of their store and they keep a spreadsheet. And so if they're gonna carry these two vibrators, they have to offset it with like some massage candles. And, and they stay on top of it because they've gotten visits from members of the zoning board and, and they've had to kind of have lengthy conversations about no, 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 you might think that we're not in accordance, but we are in accordance. And that's the price that some of these businesses pay to be in the shopping districts that they see as more desirable. And in terms of toys and who's, you know, who are the populations that are using them? Do we know about that? I yeah. mean, that was a question sort of. Yeah, that's, yeah, that being was a bought second for question. women, but really so, used for men. You know, I would say that every one of the businesses that I write about has worked really, really hard to de gender sex toys, right? To kind of make a case that sex toys don't have any gender. Anybody can use a vibrator. A vibrator is going to feel good on, you know, anybody's body, regardless of who they are. Um, so there are lots of products available um, for anyone. Um, but we definitely have, I would say, over the last, you know, 10 years, um, there has, there's a bigger footprint in the marketplace for, uh, you know, male masturbation devices that are kind of, you know, um, designed for people uh, with penises. Um, there have been more of, of those products that have been made that are available now. Oh. We don't know how much of the toys for women are bought for men. The men are, you mean, yeah. how many men are buying products for women? So oh, is the oh, question oh, if oh. feminist sex toy stores made it easier for men to buy products for women? Has it motivated men? I mean, I mean, this is a question about the broader society, right? So, I mean, well, what I can say is, um, you know, it's interesting. I kind of go back to like what the discussions were in businesses, what the debates were, and you know, there there were um, kind of discussions and debates at Good Vibrations back in the day about how actively they should be marketing to men, right? Like, is that where they should be putting their advertising dollars? And and not everybody was sure 
that that's where their marketing efforts should go because the idea was, well, you know, men have all these other stores, right? And our mission is for everybody, but really, really women at the center, even though we want to include everyone. And they only really resolved that question when they looked at, you know, marketing data. And it was, you know, not super sophisticated marketing data. It was done in house. But um, what it showed was a 50-50 split, right? That, that their customers actually were kind of 50-50. And one thing that I heard again and again from different retailers was one of their biggest surprises when they started a store in Madison, Wisconsin, or when they started the store in San Francisco, was realizing how many men didn't want to shop at those other stores. How many men were also, you know, kind of felt, you know, you know, can I shop here? I don't want to shop at those stores and really gravitated towards, you know, the feisty fun feminist sex shop. So there, there are, I mean, you know, uh, anecdotally at least, and a little bit of marketing data, you know, show that, uh, you know, men are consumers of sex toys for themselves and for people in their lives. But also it illustrates that men have a more robust set of sexual interests maybe than what the pre-existing, you know, marketplace looked like. I mean, it's it's interesting because the feminist movement generally is was looking to sort of, you know, liberate both men and women from these sort of narrow definitions of masculinity and femininity, the queer movement, again, trying to sort of take these boxes and saying that you don't have to have these two separate categories, that you can have definitions along a spectrum. Um, and, you know, in, in the marketplace, too. I mean, I think that we're at an interesting time now. I mean, I started to question Lynn backstage because I think we're at a time in our society where we, on the one hand, have, uh, like, an absence of conversations about real human sexuality. There's a shortage of these kinds of discussions. I think that sex ed is still in a sort of pathetic place in terms of what it needs to be. But we also have this massive hypersexualization in consumer culture. So everywhere you look are these really sexualized images, but they're not necessarily about real human sex and real human connections and relationships. I mean, sexuality can be a very private thing. So, you know, these men that are drawn to stores where maybe it's not, you know, in the street front or in Times Square, you know, maybe they too wanted a different way of, of approaching their intimate lives. Yeah, and I think people realize that. I mean, I think the reality is everybody benefits from sex positivity. Everybody benefits from kind of more accurate information and education in the world. And that, you know, Good Vibrations realized early on that, you know, there was a benefit to um, welcoming anybody into their fold because it just meant that more people went out in the world feeling better about themselves, feeling better about their relationships. And if people feel better about themselves and their relationships, you know, ideally, you you know, it's just a better world, right? So they really did buy into what we could argue is a rather utopian notion that, um, you know, uh, kind of accurate sexual information and, you know, kind of having access to a sex positive ethic or philosophy, um, you know, just has benefits all around for everybody, regardless of who they are. Lynn, there's a couple more questions, so let's, I just want to make sure we get to them. So you um, mentioned the good vibration throughout the whole talk, and I'm just wondering what about the marginalized population, like people who don't have the access to all these workshops. They don't have the enough money to afford these sex toys because of the high price they are retailed for. So I just want to know what you think about that. Yeah, no, it's a great question. And you know, I think um, questions of access and price point have been important for um, many of the businesses you know, that, that I study. And you know, a lot of the businesses pride themselves on the fact that people can come into a store 
and ask a question and have access to a well-trained staff whether or not they purchase anything. There is no requirement to kind of purchase a product to kind of have access to the information that you know, uh, the store provides. But you know, the, the price point and the access question is, is, a, is a really good one, particularly in this moment in time where you know, the prices of some of these products are just climbing, 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 climbing. Um, and, uh, so, you know, certain businesses are, are really committed to having a range of products, not just to um, meet different people's needs, but to speak to different people's price points. And there's this great quote in the book from Laura Javi, who um, is the owner of the tool shed in Milwaukee. And she says, look, I'm not going to buy uh, the latest $200 vibrator just because people in New York and San Francisco think it's cool. Fuck you, New York. Like, it's a, it's a great quote. She says, we're in Milwaukee. We're a working class town, you know, city. Like, I'm not going to carry a product that no one is asking for. So, you know, that was, that was her experience. But I think um, a number of the businesses that I write about try to do outreach in different ways, right? So they get out of the store. They give, you know, giveaways to kind of, you know, groups in the community that maybe aren't going to find their stores. And they give workshops. And, you know, a lot of them are, are very committed to that outreach because they know, um, you know, anything retail is not going to be accessible to anyone. Um, and there's also, um, as... Uh, less expensive products have entered the marketplace. Hasn't there also been a uh, sort of a movement and an interest in uh, creating products using materials that might be healthier for a woman's body that might have, you know, organic, lo you know, locavore produced, you know, um, artisanal products, right? I mean, there's the whole range of, of makers out there. So a lot of the businesses are concerned about questions of access um, and and the communities that they reside in, and you know are trying to figure out how to how to serve more people, how to reach more people. And I just want to say really quickly, you know, um, it was interesting to hear a few of my interviewees talk about the fact that they and and more than one person said this. They said, you know, if we were a not-for-profit sexuality drop-in center, we don't think people will come. The fact that we're a store, people know what to do with stores. They know they can come in, they can browse, they can buy something or not. And I thought that was really interesting. Like they, they were, uh, you know, making a case for a certain kind of um, accessibility and like recognizability within a consumer capitalist society that stores are these forms that cultural forms that you don't need permission to come in you don't have to fill out paperwork to come in you don't have to make an appointment to come in you don't have to give your name to come in you know all things that you would have to do even to go to Planned Parenthood so there's a sense that you know stores are at least creating a space for certain conversations. Um, and you can have those conversations for free, although certainly you can't necessarily walk out with whatever you want from the store for free. <laughs> you could try, but. You get in trouble. There's a question back there. I don't need a mic. I'm speaking louder. All right, so I'm just like kind of going over what you were talking about before, like with organic or artisanal things like mm -hmm. that. So my husband and I, we had went to a you know, store, we got a little toy, which was kind of like organic, but the longevity of it was like literally, like maybe like a week. It, I mean, I don't know oh, if it was like yeah. a week, but it took like two uses and like that was it. And then, so at first we were just like, all right, like maybe we just like kind of like going like a little hardcore. <laughs> maybe we just didn't change like the batteries or anything. And it just wasn't that, like it was just done for. And I was just like on something, I was just like, you know, touching on what you had said about something like just being like more like organic and safe for the body and things like that. It just didn't work. And it didn't come with a warranty. <laughs> okay. Because a lot I mean, of- Maybe because we were just in Romantic Depot, but I mean, it, just, it didn't. So, so that way, that's where you, you went- We got it from Romantic Depot. Romantic Depot. And, um, and like, that's where we bought it from. And then, you know, we used it like maybe like 
three times, if even. And they were probably like a week, a few weeks apart, like over like, the course of like two months, just like maybe like three times. It was it. And then like the other day, it was like, hey, let's. Well, you know, some there's probably a wide variation in policies, yeah, right, and specific I, products. You know, it's it's. Uh, I'm so sorry to hear that, um, because actually, because one of, because because one of the big trends over the past, you know, 20 years or more has been, um, you know, this attention to uh, sleek design, quality manufacturing, body safe products. Um, that doesn't mean that there's still not a lot of cheaply made crap on the market and that might be what you got or maybe something that was just you know really really um defective but with this trend towards better made products um you know some of these you know quote unquote luxury vibrators are coming with warranties some of which are like you know multi-year warranties and a lot of that kind of warranty was the result of these you know feminist sex toy shops starting to kind of you know send defective merchandise back to sex toy manufacturers which had not had happened, you know, before good vibrations started to basically say, look, people are buying products, they want them to work, they don't expect it to conk out after one or two or three uses. And, you know, there was an era of time where stuff was really shoddily made. And, um, you know, somebody I interviewed said, you know, uh, they were like Cracker Jack toys. That's how she described them. And one of the trends in the last 15 or 10 to 15 years is the number of electrical engineers, the number of design school grads, of art school grads who are starting sex toy companies. There's actually an MIT graduate that you know started a sex toy company. So um, the 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 trend is uh, is um, for for better, longer lasting products, and I you know so it's it's really sad to hear that. You know that. Yeah, I was just, I was just like responding to her. Yeah. I'm like you know, I, I never, we never thought about like using like something organic or thinking of anything. I mean, like I was that. joking a little so, with the local no, Yeah. So <laughs> I was like, hey, like, wait, well, that was kind of like us. So I was just throwing it out there. Like, but I would say, so you're in the New York area. Yes. New York City we live in, area. Yeah, we live near, closer to like Westchester. Well, if you're in the city, I mean, I don't know if you've ever stopped by and visited Babeland, but you know, a lot of a lot of those smaller businesses, they do pay attention to the products they carry and in many cases they test them beforehand to make sure that they're, you know, long lasting and durable and all of that kind of stuff. So it it actually does matter where you buy products and I'll just say as an aside one of the things that sex toy manufacturers are trying to figure out how to deal with now is, you know, we talk about piracy in the world of porn, but piracy in sex toy design is becoming more and more of a problem. And um, so you have these companies in China that are ripping off not just designs, but are actually selling them as, you know, the brand that they aren't. And they're selling them on Amazon and they're selling them, you know, at way reduced price. So it really, like, if you find a deal online that seems like, oh, too good to be true, it probably is, because you shouldn't be buying an original magic wand for $20, right? And you don't want to buy an original magic wand for $20, because you will electrocute your bits, right? And so, you know, it, this it is actually... The, this is the public service <laughs> ver portion of the evening. Protect your bits. <laughs> let's get... Let's get uh, one more question up here. Here's a microphone. I need to ask, um, is there any government agency overseeing this industry, like the toy industry yeah, or no. health? The, the question is, is there any government agency overseeing this industry? No, there's no kind of FDA kind of approved regulations. I mean, there have been people who've called for that. I'm, I'm, that's not the route I would take, right? Because I don't, I, I mean, I would like, 
the industry and manufacturers to self-regulate because I just think when you start getting like the government regulating sex toys, to me it's a potentially slippery slope, right? Like where is that going to lead? But, um, you know, so some people have thought that there should be FDA approved, you know, F, you know, kind of overseeing sex toy manufacturing. There's nothing like that now. So the industry is completely self-regulating and some folks do a great job and then, you know, others not so much, um, but it's, that's a good question. I mean, other other products that come in contact with the human body, even food products, the FDA barely regulates food packaging, for example, alternative medicine, right? Okay, well, last, last question over here. Speaking of manufacturing, I would assume that for a long time, all of these products are manufactured by male-owned businesses, right? Like all the designers and the engineers and the people selling them, like, if it took a while for women to start selling them as intermediaries, I would assume that they, would, they were produced by men originally. So was there a, a second smaller revolution of female produced actual oh, products? Oh yeah, I think we're in the throes of that revolution right now. And there was someone who I was hoping would be here tonight, but she just, um, I believe, defended her PhD dissertation today at NYU, which is an ethnography of sex toy manufacturer, Shelley Ronan. So I'm really excited to read her work. I've read a little bit of, of her work. Um, and uh, so, you know, certainly um, there have been, there have been more women who have, you know, started companies and, and moved into sex toy design and manufacturing. Um, you know, some of them are the artisanal silicone dildo manufacturing companies. So uh, Vixen Creation began in the early 90s in San Francisco. There's Tantus, which is in the kind of Sparks, Reno area of Nevada, um, which I, I personally like, you know, being in Nevada. I love the fact that the tax breaks are actually actually attracting sex toy manufacturers who find it hard to kind of manufacture in California. So yay, business, you know. Um, but so, so definitely we've seen that in the history of dildo manufacturing in the U.S. and then also, you know, some of these um, smaller artisanal kind of quote unquote luxury vibrators. But we've also seen kind of you know, men move into the industry, like Greg DeLong, who owns Enjoy, who makes these really wonderful, well-designed stainless steel products. Um, he also started in the 90s. So we've seen both, but um, yeah. We can also give credit to women for innovating a lot of these things. I mean, going back to Margaret Sanger, you know, when she began her work to try and educate women about sexual health, you know, it, she's the one who traveled around and found different forms of contraception, and then she funded the creation of con various contraceptions so that they could be produced in the United States, and she funded the research for the pill. So, you know, I think women have been at the vanguard of all of these um, sexual and bodily issues, right? You know. So there was a documentary tape once made years ago. I saw it, but I thought it's called Orgasm. It's um, it, 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 I remember seeing the tape, and it was a lot of doctors, gynecologists, you know, interviewing women or whatnot. And I remember it, the tape concludes with saying something like, a very high percentage of women. Um, in the world, you know, actually experiences orgasm. So I wonder if you have any more updated. The question is about uh, a documentary that she saw that ended by saying not enough women, very few women experience true full orgasm. And what a perfect yeah. way to end yeah. the evening. I mean, I, I, I wonder, I wonder what that I couldn't what that, resist. Um, what the name of that documentary is, I mean, uh, oh, Orgasm Inc. Orgasm Inc. Right. And that was, that's a really interesting documentary that, that kind of um, takes a look inside efforts to medicalize female sexuality. So it's kind of a critique of this move to like find the female Viagra, right? They like, you know, um, so it's a kind of critique of that. So uh, yeah, uh, Orgasm Inc. is the name of that. Um, I, don't, I don't have any kind of hard data, you know, that I can quote on the spot, but I'll 
I'll tell you, um, when it comes to actual sex science and sex research, the folks at the Kinsey Institute at Indiana University, that would be the place to look because they're the ones that do those large, large, large national surveys of stuff. Um, and I quote um, some of the data that they generated around, you know, kind of uh, sex toy use and things like that. So they do look at those things. Um, I don't know methodologically how you kind of measure I mean, I, I, yeah, I mean, but, but I guess but maybe if it's just a question, have you had an orgasm or not? Or Well, but, 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 you know, to get back to the topic of your book, I mean, these stores and the women who worked in the stores, I mean, that's sort of the, the um, grassroots consciousness raising that they were trying to do to make women more aware of what an orgasm was, you know, that they were entitled to it achieve one and help right. them become more aware of their right. body so they could do that. And, and you know, that, that's the kind of work that Betty Dodson, you know, has been doing for decades now, right? With these body sex workshops, um, you know, she's just not sitting there lecturing people about their bodies. I mean, they're kind of, the workshop participants strip down, they're naked. She takes them through kind of movements and body exercises. And one of the groundbreaking things that Betty Dodson started to do in the early 1970s was actually demonstrate um, for women how to masturbate to orgasm. And her whole philosophy was that um, she argued that women needed a visual representation of the female orgasm because they didn't know what it should look like. All they had was reference to maybe pornographic films where women were kind of, you know, to quote her, like flipping out, you know? Um, and so she felt it was really important that women could see a woman using a vibrator and, and, and having an orgasm so they could, they could, you know, see a representation of what it looked like and know what was happening to their bodies. Because she just felt like a lot of women just weren't in touch with their kind of sexual responses enough to really know how to tell if they were kind of climaxing. And, and, and you know, Betty Dodson did really radical, revolutionary work to, to um, literally showcase by showing women, you know, how to do that. So we have a lot to thank her for. And Lynn, I want to thank you because there's so few really um, academics who I think treat the subject matter as seriously and carefully as you do. So thank you. And thank you all for coming. Coming.